Okay, so this talk is going to be a little, it'll seem a little random, but the theme here is about empowering and it's through pods and pods. Um, so I've been here um, since the start. I've kind of seen it all, done it all, front and back end. Um, and at this point, I'm just a really good at pressing keyboard keys. That's what I do. Um, so like I said, I'm, I'm gonna talk about sort of um, the theme of empowering. And one of the ways that we're doing that or experimenting at the archive right now is through Kubernetes, um, which uses pods of Docker containers. And one of the big reasons that uh, that's interesting is because you can let programmers program in a language or a style or a setup or an operating system that they like or prefer and just put it out there without us having to intervene, us having to beg uh, sysadmins or ops for resources, us having to figure out how to deploy the whole thing. It just takes care of that for you. So the way this works is you have a one code repo and that will just automatically make a deployment for you into a Kubernetes cluster. Um, the way that this all works is through a simple Docker file. Well, I'll show you an example of that. It builds it for you. It deploys the uh, Docker containers into what they call pods, and it does a rolling update. It'll do rollback. It'll do monitoring. It'll do um, auto scaling as your scale goes up. Just takes care of all that for you. It's got built-in load balancers, and it'll even give you DNS names so you don't have to think about it, like semantically useful names, not just random ones. Um, if you wanna see more, I'm gonna keep this sort of short. Um, you can look at our uh, management repo, it's, it's open source, uh, how we're doing our clusters here. Uh, it also shows how to tie it into GitLab, which you can also host yourself, so you can use other alternatives, but GitLab has a really nice integration that just makes it like kind of, kind of one shot. They're also open source, um, and you can see more details about what they call auto DevOps, so that's a, a double tie-in. So here's an example. Um, I just moved to a new, a new team, and um, we're focusing on the front end. So we are really excited to try a, a new experiment with JavaScript and move most of our, our website into JavaScript and move most of it into a publicly available resource where people can make pull requests and combine all sorts of backend that's now kind of hidden under the covers. So here's an example of a Docker file. Um, if you speak Geek, you'll probably know this, but I'll just summarize it really quickly. Um, we're starting with Node as a, as a baseline. We're actually not gonna use Node, but we're gonna use NPM and, and or Yarn. We then add Nginx to the mix because we're gonna serve some static files, and that's theory all we have to do. And then a small, fast CGI wrapper that will allow you to do some really basic um, sort of backend things. So we're gonna fetch some JSON resources and then just cram it in the JavaScript do some basic setup, um, run npm install for our dependencies, and when the pod starts, this is as this bottom line here, all we have to do is fire up our little fast CGI backend wrapper and Nginx. Here's uh, sort of a, a condensed version, uh, we'll see the site in a second, of the HTML. So it includes the JavaScript file, we're gonna use web components, um, there's just a little bit of CSS there, and where it gets really interesting here is this. So this says details page, and that's a new style uh, web component, uh, different from HTML tags, but it allows you to hook JavaScript um, tie-ins very directly. We pass uh, what we call our metadata API as JSON right here. So if you've used the archive, you've probably seen archive org metadata, that's this. Here's the web components. So we're using lit element, um, which is uh, works in all browsers now except for IE 11. We have a fallback for that. Uh, and where it gets kind of cute is you just, you can just say this uh, render command and that outputs your HTML and you can access things from your metadata API. So as we change the URL, the metadata API JSON changes and the whole page changes. It's very, really nice, really simple, no real backend, nothing needed. So here's the prototype site. I'll click on that. And let's just look at an example. That's it, super fast, super easy. This is like, you know, about 100 lines of code total. But if you're familiar with the archive org uh, site, it's actually pretty, you know, it's not too far off and the video even plays right now. So that's kind of cool. We're gonna keep working on that. And what was, thanks. 
And what was nice about that is um, I did that in a week and anyone else here could do that in a week because we don't have to deal with putting out the URLs and getting the thing to deploy and getting it to build and test and all that. It just happens, so it's nice. Um, the other cool thing that involves pods is something called Solid. Solid is from uh, Sir Tim Berners, Berner, Tim Berners Lee, um, inventor of the internet, of the uh, World Wide Web, and he's doing a, a company at MIT uh, that is trying to, he's taking exception to the way that most providers are using, taking, and reselling, repurposing, having the rights for our data. And he's got a really neat idea, which is your data should be yours. You should be able to put it all in a pod somewhere, like all of your data. So it could be your pictures, your Twitter stream, your Facebook posts, anything you like. Put it in one pod of your data, and then you can give apps or other people access to it. It also is your own identity, so if you've ever used like OpenID or something like that, your pod is also your identity. It's all locked down with HTTPS and certs and, and all sorts of great security. I worked a lot with them at um, the Decentralized Web uh, Camp that we had a few months ago, and it was really fun working with them. And the nice thing, uh, the nice thing that conceptually about it is you can move your pod to anyone. Um, and if you wanna get more data, you can go to solid MIT EDU. Um, and the thing that we did at the web, uh, the D-Web camp um, was we put it on archive.org as a pod provider. So if you want to store your data on the archive, we're making that happen. So right now it's storing your data in a Kubernetes pod, so it's pods and pods. Um, but pretty soon we're actually gonna store it in, in user items, but it tags, it ties in your, your um, archive login. Let me see if this works here. Yes, yes, so the theory would be your data would wind up in an um, archive org item and you could then move it somewhere else too, but if you want it the archive, you could have it here. Um, so let's see what this does. Potential security risk ahead, that sounds excited, exciting. Let's advance and say accept the risk and continue. So what happens now is it, it sort of kicks you off to a tie-in with their system and then you'll basically have a blank pod on the archive. Now, it's not user items quite yet, but it's running inside a Kubernetes pod, so we have a nice little uh, site and worked with the main guy on that. That was a lot of fun. Oops, wrong slide. Back, back. Okay. Uh, yeah, pods and pods. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about in this uh, short little burst is diversity. Um, so I've been at the archive for about 25 years, and I gotta say, there's a lot of white dudes here. Um, and the internet was kinda built by a lot of white dudes. Not entirely, but there's a lot of white dudes. Um, diversity is hard, um, but I believe very strongly it makes everyone and teams and ideas stronger. We get best of breed, we get things we didn't think about or expect, so I wanna encourage you on Aaron Swartz Day to think about diversity and try to encourage it and get it to happen more wherever you're involved. The tech industry is a tough one right now. Um, I really started thinking about this a lot when Dana Boyd accepted her EFF Freedom Award. And the thing that really kind of gutted me, and I was crying a lot that week, I even cried at our Friday uh, open lunch, um, wasn't so much you know, thinking about the women who have been physically abused or, or otherwise, because that's awful. But it was, it was thinking about, and I just quoted it here, it's just thinking about, how many women have been lightly excluded or not invited to the game or invited to lunch or, you know, they're just not really our people or whatever. And it's, it could be women, it could be minorities, it could be someone who's queer, it doesn't really matter. Just someone who's a little different. When you're excluded like that, it, what really hurt is to think about how many women in this case, but just diverse people have been kind of not invited or subtly, discouraged, and I think we all need to work about the, work on that and think about it. If you look at the rates, I don't actually have the real numbers in my head, but I believe, I believe last time I read it, it was very high. The number of women who leave tech 
is staggering. It's something like 60 or 80% or more. My best friend um, from Cornell switched her major to become an electrical engineer. She's really smart. She was a coder, then she was a manager, and finally she's not doing it because it's just a tough industry. You have to kind of deal with kind of a, a male-designed industry with a lot of men. And it doesn't mean men are bad. Um, I work with lots of great men. Uh, my new team is 50% uh, white dudes, but it also means it's 50% not. So I'm actually really happy with that. And it turns out the people, the white guys in my team are incredibly great with diversity. So that's one of the reasons that I was excited to join their team. Um, and so I'm gonna close with something that we just um, saw on stage here at our archive annual. Um, Michael Barker, who's the librarian from Phillips Academy Andover, is a white dude. And he comes from a very privileged institution um, from the Boston area. My dad actually went here. It's a really, really nice bespoke school. And he did something really cool. He worked with Brewster and he got excited because they have an amazing book collection. And he decided with Brewster, to encouraged by Brewster's um, and what we do here, to make it all public and to all to put it all in the archive and digitize all of it. So, and he gave a, he gave a nice quote: "Anybody that has any connection to an institution like mine, that comes with a certain amount of privilege. Nudge that privilege towards a public purpose." And I think that's the kind of thing that we need to do. If you have privilege, try to help other people who don't or have less. Um, and we will make the world a much better place. And maybe it'll be more about empower her. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Tracy, um, we're gonna talk. If you go to the, to the middle, um, uh, I don't know where the second microphone is. Oh. It's next to the tower. This guy? Okay, great. So, um, if you could, so we could just do a little Q&A while they're setting up Ryan's oh, okay. machine. That's what we're gonna do to try to kind of move things along. Yeah, great. And so does anybody um, have any questions from what, uh, tr what Tracy was talking about with Kubernetes? No, okay. So, so I, have a, I have a question. I'm sure everyone has lots of questions. <laughs> That's probably too many. Um, so yeah, um, I wanted to know about this pod repository and specifically kind of like, what does that actually mean and how could I make a pod and put it in the repository? Uh, that's a great question. So um, in my slides, and if you go to the, the Google pods or something like that, they have a nice little um, make your own pod integrated application on your lunch break. And I, and I was like, <laughs> wow. Um, but it actually looks probably doable. I didn't actually step through it yet, but it looks like they're aiming for about 15, 30 minute integration or, or possibly less. Um, and what that would allow you to do is, um, I think what they were suggesting is making, putting a login via your pod. So let's say you put your pod on archive, you can then put a login on a small little website and then you can start um, allowing other people to view your data and you can start putting in photos. So that was their kind of, their quick uh, demo. So it just allows you to have all of your data somewhere else and the theory would be through the magic of JavaScript everywhere, uh, the apps throughout the world would start switching over to it. That's the hope. That, that's the way I understand it. I'm, I'm not a, okay. a solid pod expert, but that's, that's how I understand it. Okay, and then I wanna ask something about when you say putting everything in JavaScript, are we assured that there is enough standardization of the browser implementations of JavaScript that that's not gonna be a, a path to destruction, if you will? Well, so I didn't show this in the prototype, but um, the thing that excited the whole team this week that we only, we've been looking for a couple years for exactly this reason, is um, Google's got something called Rendertron. If you remember one thing, if you're a hacker, just remember that word and Google it afterwards. You did yesterday for oh, Rendertron? Yeah. yeah, it's a, uh, hold on a second. Actually, I can do it with a microphone. It's Rendertron. <laughs> kind of Freddie Mercury-like. Rendertron. Rendertron, one word. Um, and so, Google will crawl you, 
And if you make a single page web app in JavaScript, a lot of crawlers are going to look at that and go, great, it's one tag, I have no idea what you're talking about, bye. Or they'll, they'll devalue you, or go, in Google's case now, they'll put you in the slow lane for crawling. So what, they'll, what they're given us as a little gift, um, and it's from Google, is headless Chrome stuck in a Node.js thing that you run, and you do, they actually suggest you do this, which surprised me, user agent detection, where if it's a, if it's a crawler, <clears throat> you run Rendertron, which basically fires up a browser on the back end, loads your code, loads all the JavaScript, and basically gets you markup and sends that to the, the crawler. And as a further experiment, I tried sending that same data to Microsoft Internet Explorer 11, because it sucks and it doesn't understand web components or anything totally worked. So I think we're finally at the point now where we can do user agent detection to fall back for the old stuff and forget all the polyfills, forget all the, the you know, and just move to the new, the new shining, great awesomeness that's JavaScript. Okay. That and was a long, long answer. Sorry about that. But 